I'm Spencer with Fourth View, and thank you so much for joining us for this edition of Zooming In. We're taking a look at the economic recovery, where we're at, where we're going, something that's constantly in flux, and hopefully we can get some insights today. So we've got Ross Marshon joining us, the VP of Policy over at the Taxpayer Protection Alliance. And then we've also got the team from EIA Alpha Partners, Andrew Middlebrooks, Nafal Sanula, and Charles Chen with us. So, so thank you guys for joining us. And just before we get started, Dylan Thomas, uh, on his strategist at Fourth Feed, just before we get going, just a little bit of ground rules. Um, we wanted to make this, or we're trying to make this as similar to our normal roundtables that we host during the rest of the year, and which typically people are interacting, it's in person. So, um, so we have people's mics muted, but um, if you want to ask a question, just try to either raise your hand or just message or come somewhat let us know and then that we can give you um, an option to ask your question during the discussion so um so that way um you know ross or andrew have an opportunity to still talk but you still have an, a chance to get in your question we'll also be taking questions at the end of the session as well we'll give it, we'll give time to dedicated faq as well so thank you brilliant yeah so I think the question we'll start off with uh, to kind of break the ice is simply, what uh, have you guys seen in the past week that surprised you regarding the economic recovery? I know Ross, we talked a little bit about this, so why don't you share some of your thoughts? Sure, absolutely. Um, obviously, I don't have to tell you guys this, the numbers that we saw last week in the jobs report are phenomenal. And you had a 10 million job turnaround between expectations versus reality. Um, and suffice to say, if you had a situation that economic analysts were expecting um, out of this jobs report last week of 20% unemployment, I think you would have a negative feedback loop and you would have a lot of pessimism, the stock market would drop off and there would be all sorts of negative consequences. Instead, you saw a drop in the unemployment rate from 14.7% to 13.3%. Now, of course, um, that is no cause for um, unqualified celebration, but it is a step in the right direction. And I think the businesses across the country are looking for um, signs of optimism. And they certainly got that with the addition of 2.5 million jobs in May. Um, the most unexpected, most surprising thing for me looking at this data is we're probably about six weeks into reopening. Uh, from when the first states like Alaska, like Colorado, like Georgia, um, first started uh, limiting reopen plans. This was the last week of April, and it was an open question as to how businesses and individuals would respond. It's one thing for a state or for a locality to say, hey, businesses, you're reopen. Um, go about life um, kind of sort of as it was before. But it's another matter entirely for individuals and businesses to feel comfortable enough to go along with that. And going into May, um, you have really good uh, mobility tracking data by this firm called Cubix. And Cubix found that around April 30th, May 1st timeframe, um, you still saw even in early reopened states like Georgia, uh, like Colorado, Arkansas, which never even had a stay at home order to begin with, um, the percentage of people staying at home, staying, um, in their words, within 330 feet of their houses, seven day rolling average, um, that was still up 30%. So that was an open question as to would that maintain its elevation? Um, would it go down? Would people start to re-engage with broader society? Um, and I think you're seeing both with the updated Cubix mobility data and with the jobs data that we saw last week, people are going out back into the world. And that is cause for celebration, even if not unqualified celebration because that 13.3% unemployment rate um, is still far too high. Um, so that's my key takeaway. That's my um, that's my surprise looking at that data from last week. Andrew, what are you seeing from companies? Um, well, I, you know, from, well, I guess it you know, depends on which companies you're talking about. Um, you know, it's been kind of a, you know, interesting, you know, earnings quarter um, that we've seen so far um, where, you know, the, you know, losers have been, you know, you know, punished, but also, you know, it's really kind of tough to see, you know, I guess, and forecast the future, uh, you know, when many companies are pulling guidance, not providing guidance, 
uh, which does make sense. And, you know, but I guess I would kind of, you know, to Ross's point, you know, the 2 million jobs that we added, uh, I, you know, I think one of the things that we kind of talked about internally, one of the, I guess the phrases that we put on it was, you know, yeah, you know, these jobs, but I mean, it's like, okay, I, it's like saying I got a new t-shirt from the Salvation Army. Um, you know, these weren't like new jobs that just like sprouted up. Like it was just mostly just people, you know, being hired back or being brought, brought back to work. And then the, you know, difference between the actual unemployment rate and the you know, classification of, you know, people that have been furloughed, you know, obviously made that number look a little bit better than it, it you know, actually would have been if, you know, they would have properly classified, you know, those workers. And so for us, you know, it, it, you know looking at this market, it's been, um, you know, kind of a dash for trash rally. Um, you know, when you start to see companies that are, you know, file for bankruptcy, um, that are moving, you know, up a hundred percent on a, you know, daily basis. Um, it's really a kind of an interesting environment and an environment that really isn't too attractive for sometimes taking, you know, longer term risk, uh, longer term bets on uh, in individual companies, because ultimately, um, you know, it's really kind of tough to, you know, forecast the future when, you know, you don't have uh, certain, you know, clarity on, you know, elections, um, you know, what policies are going to be going forward. And then also with, you know, the looming potential of a, you know, uh, a second wave of the virus, um, you know, does that ultimately lead back to, uh, you know, you know, shutdowns or, um, or is there just a, you know, an acceptable amount of, you know, human casualties that people are just willing to accept uh, because they're not willing to, you know, go back, go back under lockdown. And, you know, those are some of the things that we've been looking at, um, you know, from our end. Well, in many ways, I mean, the market term that everyone likes to throw around these days is just rotation. We're kind of constantly looking, going, okay, what sector is going to be next that people are going to toss their money behind? Uh, Nafal, maybe you can speak a little bit to this. How much of that is also just kind of this concept of a new distribution, like you're saying, of jobs, a new distribution of perhaps wealth and income as well, where you're seeing much more control being consolidated amongst the largest companies. And they're the ones that are certainly appear to be thriving. Uh, what do you see in the macro data on that? Well, first of all, along those lines, I would say that um, the initial rally off the lows, we kind of think was a policy driven rally. You know, um, the monetary backstop to the credit markets was very potent and the fiscal backstops were probably the most potent I've seen in my life. Um, the unemployment insurance expansion um, by the federal government basically made whole the lion's share of the lower end of the income distribution. Um, extremely, extremely effective policy. Um, so as we moved past the initial policy rally, you know, we saw a lot of the mega cap tech companies that, um, you know, they had a lot of tailwinds coming into it that were only accelerated by the, by the virus. And they kind of, and there's such a big weight in the indexes that they, they really powered everything higher. And then as we saw the reopenings occur, then we kind of saw the beginning of a reopening rally mixed in with this kind of dynamic of, a bunch of Silicon Valley engineers and Wall Street bankers, you know, sitting at home day trading, amplifying those uh, those dynamics. What I would say along the lines of the reopening rally is, um, unlike Europe, unlike East Asia, unlike New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, the lion's share of the rest of the country's virus data looks a lot more similar to emerging markets than it does to, you know, Western Europe, uh, you know, the Acela corridor in the U.S. and East Asia. Um, in fact, Arizona in mid-June, early June, is already reaching ICU capacity constraints. Um, it doesn't appear that there's going to be policy response to accommodate or to, to deal with this um, unless we have truly exponential growth. So we kind of discount continued persistent linear growth trajectories in the virus cases, similar to what we see in a lot of emerging markets. Um, and we wouldn't be surprised if the U.S. is not invited to some of these regional uh, trade and travel blocks that are emerging across the world in, in, in countries that have successfully really, really bent the curve, not just flattened it. But um, along the lines of your original question, I would say, um, look, you know, like Andrew mentioned, there's about a 3% delta um, that needs to be accounted for because of the fact that uh, the unemployment, the, the non-farm payrolls data is a survey-based indicator. And folks who um, were furloughed are, are not are not responding as unemployed, um, and 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 the report itself said so. 
But even if you take that into account, there was still a net decline in the unemployment rate um, this, this past month, which I think really speaks to the efficacy of the, of the um, payroll protection program. Um, you know, it seems like a lot of the hiring occurred to maintain those PPP loans, since that's what the loans are contingent upon in the first place. Um, we, we don't expect that to be a durable uh, phenomenon on the margin. Um, and and we're, we're quite concerned about these second order effects, um, whether it's state and local budgets um, getting ahead, whether it's uh, uh, layoffs moving up the income, channel, income ladder, which we're starting to see. Um, and, and, and all of these things, um, I, I think, are relatively well protected if we continue to keep the unemployment insurance enhancement protected. But we just had the Senate Financial uh, Services Committee speak today, um, and it seems pretty clear that the, the Senate GOP wants to replace the federal enhancement to unemployment insurance with some sort of return to work bonus. And we think that would be a net, net negative fiscal impulse on the margin at a relatively dangerous time in the macro. But in terms of the financial market impact, um, you know, we are in a momentum market, and um, it can be any catalyst that cracks it. But um, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, a macro downturn, you know, at least on the margin, gets kind of, you know, shaken off by, by some of these, you know, retail momentum punchers. Um, but that, that's, that's my, my, my basic view of, um, you know, what, what surprised me the most was the, the effectiveness of PPP surprised even me, and I was already pretty bullish on it. Um, but I wouldn't be too optimistic based on this report alone. And I actually fear that um, the political, the political impetus and the political response to this number is going to be uh, too exuberant and push push a necessary fiscal package probably to a window closer to the election. And in the meantime, we're, we're likely to see a little bit of macroeconomic volatility reemerge. Okay, Charles, what's what surprised you lately? Sorry, what was that? You cut out a little bit. Oh, uh, I was just curious as we were going around the room, what was surprising you in the recovery? Um, I don't think we found anything super surprising. I think, you know, back to what Andrew was talking about, what was mostly surprising about the last, you know, kind of week or two was kind of that dash for trash rally. I think you've got, you know, kind of people who are bidding up companies that are bankrupt where basic corporate finance would kind of tell you that they are more or less effectively worthless. Um, I think the one that we've been following the closest is uh, Hertz, where, you know, after filing for bankruptcy, it was trading at around 50, 60 cents. And then all of a sudden, it's a it's a $700 million market cap company again. And, you know, that's kind of the, the epitome of, you know, what a kind of V-shaped recovery could potentially look like. But not only do we not kind of see that recovery happening, I think a lot of these companies throughout the crisis have, you know, started to to load up debt on their capital structures, which fundamentally makes the equity um, less valuable. But not only that, when you put that much debt in front of cap structures like that, and you look at these bankrupt companies, I think what you have a tendency to find is that, you know, most of these bankrupt companies, um, the equity holders just aren't going to get paid out. So I think there's this, you know, bit of irrational exuberance just in terms of projecting kind of the, this, the amount of green shoes that we're seeing in, into the future um, without, you know, kind of taking into account for the amount of risk that you're actually taking in, in investing in these companies. Um, so I think kind of, kind of the, the strength of the rally was the most surprising in the last, uh, last week or two, but um, I guess in terms of kind of the, the uptick in economic data so far, uh, it's not terribly surprising. But you know, going from going from negative fifty to to zero doesn't really mean much uh, from our perspective quite yet. Okay, so if I may, if I could add something, from the market-based perspective, um, looking at how V-shaped that recovery was. It's very interesting in that it highlights the efficiency of markets because, I mean, look in particular at the Jets ETF for crying out loud. You have all these call stocks. Oh, sorry, say that again, Andrew. I don't know if I would call that, you know, a, a efficient, an efficient market. Um, uh, I mean, what's been, what's been happening? I think that, you know, that's more of a market structure thing that you know people don't understand is you know how ETFs are you know, constructed and that's kind of why we've seen the 
you know, large cap companies continue to grow larger because, you know, there's a hundred thousand, you know, I'm exaggerating, but there's a hundred thousand ETFs that have Facebook, a Apple, Netflix, uh, you know, Alphabet and Google in them and, and Amazon. And when that happens, you know, that those push flows in, you know, uh, passive price insensitive flows into these stocks. Uh, and, and, you know, you kind of artificially bids them up, uh, but then also, you know, that like there's one, you know, liquidity is a, you know, uh, is a door that has, you know, one entrance and uh, one exit. And so, you know, when things get whippy, you know, whether on the upside or the downside, you know, it, it's, um, you know, things, you know, tend to get, uh, you know, a little over, you know, tend to overshoot, but uh, sorry, I didn't mean to you know, cut you off. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I was just saying efficient um, in the idea that the current price is quickly taking into account future expectations. So the fact that, and this is right, uh, common wisdom on the street would hold something like, oh, the airlines aren't really carrying any passengers right now. And, and obviously times are very bad for the airlines. Okay, that's common sense. Um, so therefore it's the ultimate buying opportunity. Um, yeah, but you have to act very quickly because everyone else is saying that, including people with a lot of skin in the game in terms of investment assets. So they're quickly piling into um, ETFs that capture movement of large airlines and that price went up very, very quickly. So now, even though you have still way diminished demand for the airlines, um, the index is way up from where it was, let's say, uh, mid to late March. And then you kind of run into that question of markets anticipating six months, nine months down the road versus where we are in terms of reality in the actual economy. What do you guys right, see? Right, markets are forward thinking. Yes. What do you guys see as the discrepancy between that basic, or in other words, where do you think we are before the economy rebounds to where it was pre COVID versus in the markets? We're basically back to where we were in, let's say, January. Or so, I mean, with the NASDAQ, I think today we might have even closed above where we were. Certainly, we're positive on the year. And I think the S&P is kind of within a couple of points as well, I'm sure. Uh, Andrew and Alpo can confirm. A, a, yeah. large part, a, a large part of why the S&P and the NASDAQ in particular are so close to their highs is because, again, going back to market structure, it, the, the indexes are so concentrated among the, the five largest tech companies who fundamentally, this was a tailwind for them, right? Um, you know, just, just uh, you know, everybody's using Amazon cloud servers to work from home. You know, I, I, it's, it's interesting because there's almost like an emerging industrial policy that's forming in the United States, where, you know, Apple and Google are providing the, the COVID tracking and mobility to you know? And so, you know, it makes sense that, you know, the, the, big five, the big five tech companies that are, you know, really, really big, them getting bigger and them having, their ex anti tailwinds accelerate through this crisis. By this crisis, they by themselves can drive the indexes quite high. Um, so you know, there's a, there's an extent to which that's playing a big role in terms of what's baked in. But if you take them out of the equation, or you look at something like the Russell 2000, and you look at the small caps, and you look at as opposed to just the concentrated big companies, but like the the distribution of equities, I think that's where the bigger discrepancy is because a lot of these companies are discounting returns to normal. And, and a big reason I think that's happening is because there is unprecedented retail flow into the market. You know, we, we were just looking at some Goldman uh, Prime data earlier today, Credit Suisse Prime data earlier today. Effectively, what's happening is there's a massive wall of retail money that's, that's, that's squeezing hedge funds out of their shorts. And it's creating an, a, a, a feedback loop higher in, in some of these names to where they end up discounting very, very rapid returns to normal. Whereas, you know, I, in my, in my macro perspective, that would be a possibility if two things were to occur. One, we really, we really crush the case count curve and not just flatten it. In the U.S., again, you know, we look, most of the countries, state by state, county by county data, looks more like Brazil and India's than it does like China's or, or Germany's um, or South Korea's or Taiwan. It's really just New York, New Jersey, Connecticut that looks like China, Taiwan, et cetera. Um, so one, if we really saw a, um, you know, some real green shoots in terms of crushing the case count trajectory, um, and, and especially in these reopening states, and then two, if we saw the sufficient amount of fiscal stimulus to hold us through and replace lost income so that there aren't second order effects that emerge 
um, and, 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 what, and that kind of becomes a snowball effect. And right now, as it stands, uh, we had a pretty, pretty strong fiscal impulse going on right now. But for example, if we don't expand state and local uh, support, government support, if, if, we, if we don't basically use Alexander Hamilton's notion of federal backstops of state and local debt, um, which ironically enough, Europe seems to be uh, converging toward, if we don't do more of that in the U.S., we will see second second round effects that that are that w irrespective of the, the the virus trajectory. If we don't see if if we see the unemployment insurance enhanced by the federal government get replaced by a four hundred fifty dollar a week return of the work bonus, I would imagine that would be a pretty big negative shock to the, the to the support to the low end, which has the highest marginal propensity to consume. So as we start to see these kind of rolling fiscal cliffs emerge, I wouldn't be surprised to see the return to normal to not be a V-shape. And ultimately, it could be the case that it, the market starts to get shaky and then it pressures DC into that sufficient response. And then we can talk more, a little bit more about um, you know, a genuine V-shaped recovery or a genuine return to normal. But as it stands right now, I do think there's a disconnect between markets and, econo and, and economics. And I don't think that this is I think this this happens all the time. I think markets do this all the time. Um, you know, the the efficiency of markets, it's in my mind, is in the eye of the beholder. But you know, I've gone through many mini bubbles in my day. Um, you know, I I was trading both sides of energy and fertilizer stocks in summer of spring and summer of '08. We saw what happened with all altcoins. We've seen what happened with biotech. You know, these things emerge all the time. You know, ultimately markets are supply and demand. Um, they are a discounting mechanism if the, if, if the liquidity is flowing in both directions properly, but, but a, lot, a big chunk of the time, it ends up being driven by price and sensitive actors. And right now we have price and sensitive actors as a one-way street. You know, retail flows are predominantly, it seems like, if a company has a low share price, I want to buy as much of it as possible. And the longer it works, the more people go in and the, the smaller the exit door it gets. We also have a re, you know, we have the we have the price insensitive systematic flows from like the risk parity investors and, and the vol targeting investors starting to scale back up a little bit as well. And so there's really no one on the other side of the boat um, that that has the the staying power to deal with this. And ultimately, we're going to need to see the dry powder just kind of evaporate before things really get moving. But I wouldn't read as much like you know again the move to 28, 2900 and S&P. I think was very rational um, and it reflected the very efficacious policy response we got from both the Fed and Congress. But the moves since then, I'm a lot more skeptical about, you know, we, we, we caught the lion's share of the move down and we caught the lion's share of the move up to 2900. Since then, and that's predominantly been the reopening rally, um, we've been a lot more skeptical about, it's certainly the case that the disconnect can get wider and wider and the divergences can get wider and wider. Um, in fact, that's probably our expectation. But, um, you know, when, when, when we do kind of see this dynamic uh, cease, uh, we think there will be quite a bit of uh, convergence required between the, the financial markets and the, and the macro economy. As it is. So, Ross, how Can do we you talk a little bit more about the fiscal policy aspect of this? Certainly. So, you know, um, there's basically nothing as potent as replacing lost income, right? So the, the unemployment and insurance enhancement not only made whole most folks who were making 70k or less lost their job but for the minimum wage type of cohorts they actually got pay raises which is extremely extremely stimulative because we have such high inequality that the inequality itself is a big drag on growth because the folks who are making money that money goes directly back into the savings into financial assets and the folks who actually spend most of what they make aren't making it or aren't seeing big wage growth so you know a big stimulus that's progressively targeted toward the lower end in a very high inequality environment as we, are, as we have today in the United States is extremely stimulative. And to replace that with a return to work bonus, that's not only smaller, but it's targeted toward folks who are actually getting reemployed is going to be a big uh, de like net decline on the margin in terms of the fiscal stimulus and the, the impulse of that fiscal stimulus. You know, a corporate tax cut worth a trillion dollars is unlikely to move the needle that much in terms of macroeconomic growth because corporate taxes are not really constraining investments or, or higher. It's really just demand that is, and the demand is constrained by the distribution of income right now. Unlike it was in the 80s when the distribution of income was very different and taxes were much higher. It's an opposite environment today. Same thing, 
you know, a trillion dollars of corporate tax cuts versus a trillion dollars of unemployment insurance enhancement by the federal government, there's a big difference in the multipliers. And, 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 and replacing the federal enhancements on unemployment insurance with a return to work bonus that's about 25% less in terms of aggregate money, the aggregate impulse goes down, but the multiplier goes down even more so. That's, that's, that, that, and it's, it's, it's poorly timed as well because we are just now starting to see the second quarter effects emerge. Layoffs are moving up the income ladder now. It's not just the, the poorest of the poor that are getting laid off. You're seeing firms like Cognizant and IBM and Boeing start to hit folks who have 401k flows. And, and you're also seeing emerging crises in the state and local budgets. You know, these, these, are, these are big, big drivers of employment. Um, and and, and those, those feedback loops can work in both directions. So, you know, we, we believe, especially what's happening with the unemployment insurance enhancement, that rolling off July 31st, is a very underappreciated dynamic because I don't think the market or most macro economists really understand the extent to which that specific um, policy, that specific provision in the CARES Act led to this rebound. It was extremely stimulative. I would argue far more so than anything the Fed did, far more so than the, than the mailing the checks, far more so than the PPP. Um, and so and allowing that to sunset and replacing it with a much lower multiplier policy is likely to have macroeconomic implications. Well, the, the PPP recently got extended. Um, you have some tweaks that were recently signed into law just a few days ago, providing for the increase of forg forgivability and loans uh, from a two-month period to a six-month period, and also allowing business owners, business, business recipients of PPP to have more flexibility in what they spend on the loans. Um, not necessarily payroll related expenses. Um, for example, if a business owner wanted to um, invest a lot of money in a high-end air filter to kill coronavirus or filter coronavirus, and in that way ultimately have sustainable operations, now because of the tweaks and because of more PPP flexibility, the business owner is able to do that without facing the prospect of losing out on those loans. Um, so certain, so certain well-targeted recent tweaks are really important. But in terms those of, are, some of the big, oh, pic, if I may, if I may, so the big picture um, proposed stimulus measures, specifically on the state and local level. I mean, look in the real world, you have states and localities, in particular what TPA has studied in the case of Maryland and New Jersey and New York. The asks of these governors far exceed the coronavirus-related losses, and on the federal level. You have the United States Postal Service, they're asking for an $89 billion bailout when the financials don't even remotely support that. So in the real world, what happens is you have localities, you have states, and you have federal agencies that get into a lot of financial trouble even preceding a crisis like the pandemic, and they have asks, financial asks for taxpayer aid that far exceed coronavirus-related losses and they'll take that money and they'll use it to subsidize um, really bad mismanagement practices that, again, predate the pandemic. So we have to be very careful in any state and local aid to make sure that it's just it's not a series of boondoggles. It doesn't result in waste of taxpayers. You already have diminished federal fiscal capacity because the deficit this year is already approaching $4 trillion. So we have to be very, very careful in future relief measures to make sure that we're not subsidizing bloated state and local government operating structures that are a drag on economic growth and not a contributor to economic here's, growth. Here's a, here's a few things I would say. First of all, you know, the United States deficit is, is denominated in the currency that the United States can print. So the same reason why Japan has twice as debt to GDP as the United States can borrow for 10 years at 0% interest rates. You know, there's no, there's no fiscal constraint, there's no bond market constraint to these deficits. It's primarily inflation. And we have very, very, we have aging demographics, we have a lot of private sector debt, and we have very high inequality. All three of those things are very disinflationary factors. Inflation is not spiraling out of control. And that's why, you know, the 10 year yields at 1%, less than 1%, there, there's plenty of fiscal capacity. In fact, we could probably triple the deficit and it, it, and it wouldn't lead to any real fiscal constraints. I, don't, I wouldn't argue what that. What about interest needed. payments? What about, what about yeah, interest exactly. payments so, at a moderately so, higher interest rate? Well, again, the central bank determines the interest rates, which is exactly why the, the 10 year yield is under 1%, despite the fact that we've blown out the deficit. There's, if you look at the correlation between uh, interest, you know, interest rates and 
and deficit, you'll see it at the state and local level because state and locals can't print dollars. But you will not see that in a monetarily sovereign uh, entity like the U.S. government, the Japanese government, the, the German government, the Swiss government. You know, it's a completely different uh, fiscal constraint versus a household budget or, or a, a state and local budget. But on top of that, too, you know, we can, we can go back and forth um, about, you know, the, the fairness or optimality of, of the state and local debts. And, you know, I have views, you have views. But what I would say is, one, the lion's share of especially blue state, state and local, um, you know, budget, you know, budgets being kind of like, you know, big and bloated, is because they're basically replacing lack of safety nets on the federal level, which is why you see, you know, really, really poor outcomes in, in, in states that, you know, try to use tax cuts to generate, you know, growth, and then, you know, it never kind of works out. Not to mention whether or not it's optimal or fair, it's going to have a very deleterious macroeconomic impact. If, if, we're, if we're optimizing for growth and if we're optimizing for entrepreneurialism, if we're optimizing for effectively capitalism, if we're, op if we're optimizing for the engine of American growth, it's, it's going to be macroeconomically necessary to, to expand state and local aid in order to prevent downside feedback loops from emerging. And then the last thing I would say is that the PPP, although very efficacious, was a, it, it's, its primary impact on the economy is, primary, is, is, is quite front-loaded because the most potent impact it has on the economy is to protect the payrolls. And that's basically what we saw in the May report. I don't anticipate that being as big of a driver going forward because people who took out the loans in April already hired those, as many people as they needed back in May to preserve their loans. Now, there are certainly ancillary positives uh, in terms of, like you were saying, being able to reallocate um, you know, th th those lent funds toward very optimal uses. I think it's excellent, for example, like you mentioned, that they're able to, you know, the, 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 the regulations have alleviated so they can, okay, it's, it's fair and it's, it's acceptable to have UV lights in an office space and that money, you know, it, it makes total sense. But I would consider those to be relatively ancillary in terms of the macroeconomic impulse, the predominant macroeconomic impulse was just the actual protection of payrolls, predominantly because the lion's share of payrolls that were hit earlier on the crisis were among the lowest end of the income distribution, which are the same folks that, you know, unless you have the lowest end of the income distribution getting pay raises and getting paid to begin with, it's impossible for corporations to see the enough demand in the economy to invest in, in anticipation for it. And that's why, again, I like to draw the distinction between the backdrop in the 70s and 80s when, you know, taxes were high, inequality was low, and inflation was high, and supply side type of policies would make a lot of sense. Fiscal policy is much less necessary. Monetary policy is far more efficacious versus now where we have low interest rates, we have low inflation, we have very high inequality. And in that environment, fiscal policy makes a lot more sense. And you want to target demand side stimulus specifically toward the low end of the labor uh, distribution. This is a much more contextual um, a, 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 like framework as opposed to an ideological one. And I think the ideological frameworks have their time in the sun. It's kind of like broken clocks will always be right twice a day type of thing. But in order to really navigate the different regimes, the different macroeconomic regimes, I think state contingency and, count, and context really matter. And the backdrop we have today is very different than we did in the past. And I think that the, the reason why this policy response was so efficacious in the first place it's because it was so progressive. It targeted the lowest end of the labor force. Um, and, and, and kudos to, to uh, Secretary Mnuchin for you know, finding a way to uh, ink a deal with Senator um, Schumer. Um, because if we had gone down the route of Senator McConnell's original proposal, I, I, I don't think we would have, I think we would have needed a, a, an immediately, another immediate fiscal package. I don't think we would have bottomed in March. We would have probably bottomed in April or May. Um, but, you know, it seems like Secretary Mnuchin really has a really good, has built up a lot of political capital and was able to get through an extremely effective response. And, and again, it, you know, I'm a bond market trader, right? I trade interest rates for a living. And uh, at no point am I concerned about, uh, I'm not sitting here selling bonds because of the deficit. I'm only gonna sell bonds if I think that the Federal Reserve is gonna hike rates in anticipation for inflation. And what's happening now is the Federal Reserve is saying, and we already targeted the overnight rate, we might as well target the 10 year rate too. That's exactly how we funded World War II, and that's exactly what Japan's doing right now. And there's no inflation, there's no bond market vigilantes. I think it's a very key critical point. 
the differentiation between how a federal budget works versus how a household or state and local budget works. You, you know, like I said, you could probably triple our deficit in America without causing any of these ancillary concerns. Um, you probably see a lot more corruption. You probably see a lot more, uh, you know, pork spending and this and that. Um, but so long as it's targeted toward the lowest of the income, it would actually probably increase fixed investments among corporations because there would be more effective demand to invest in anticipation for. Yeah, there's no doubt that the federal but government not, is very different from a household. Oh, I'm sorry, Spencer, go on. No, you notice we just opened up the question asking people whether they think, regardless of whether it's effective or not, are we likely to get additional stimulus programs from the government this year? So I'm sure you've got some thoughts on that, Ross, and I'm curious to hear your response. Absolutely. There. Right, regardless of the wisdom or efficacy of future government stimulus, I think it's very likely, and lawmakers are discussing this now. Even if this upcoming phase is going to be the last phase of relief, there is almost certainly going to be another phase. Um, just because reopening processes across the country, particularly we're talking about very populated states like California, um, Illinois, New Jersey, New York, they're going to have especially slow reopening periods. So there is going to be a perceived need um, to have a very broad based fiscal relief program. Um, and this is, I look at government stimulus as a continuous um, process because, again, and this isn't, this has been kind of underreported that uh, just in the past week or so, we have significant changes to PPP where, you know, payrolls were initially protected, uh, but only for eight weeks. And you have businesses in New York and New Jersey saying, okay, eight weeks of payroll protection is all well and good, um, but what about when the pain um, goes longer than eight weeks and, and goes um, beyond the midsummer? And now because of recently passed and signed to law legislation, we have that protection uh, for six months. And as I discussed before, uh, greater flexibility. Um, because the government is always trying to spend more money and appease constituencies, um, the first sign of trouble or suffering is going to be accommodated um, with increased stimulus, um, especially during an election season. Um, so it's pretty much unavoidable. Um, but what we need to do is we need to focus on the very bad as aspects of policy, poorly targeted state and local aid, and say, look, these are bloated budget requests. These are going to create more problems than they're going to solve. And in terms of future interest payments, uh, not fall into um, the problem or the trap of present-based thinking and saying, look, there may be a time in the future where the reserve currency dynamics we see now no longer hold. And if that's the case and we have such a bloated debt burden, interest payments are going to be unbearable. You need to think, you need to transcend the current moment and think what will happen if we have this level of debt projected um, under a slightly different reality where we don't have full control of interest rates. And that's very important to keep in mind. Um, if we want to talk about stimulus that's very targeted um, for healthcare providers, for example, um, continued PPP, which um, which is passed already and signed into law, but, but maybe additional small business relief for uh, businesses with 50 employees or fewer. Um, what we typically think of as small businesses. I mean, that is definitely part of the discussion. So there's going to be that push. The push is inevitable for increased stimulus. The question we have to ask ourselves is what is targeted and what will not um, break the bank? I mean, that is very important going forward. What is sustainable and what will help people who are truly in need as a result of the pandemic? So on that note, I'm curious to open up the floor a bit to see if anyone in the audience has some questions uh, that they'd like to ask. Well, we've got these guys here. Go ahead and feel free to either send a message or uh, if you want to raise your hand and we can go to your mics. You must, you must have answered all the questions. <laughs> While we're waiting, if you don't mind me hopping in for just a moment. No, not at all. Thank you, Spencer. So, Ross, um, the, the, the point you brought up, um, well, first of all, I would agree with you that, um, especially in an election year, more stimulus is likely. Kind of the sequencing that we're expecting is, you know, allowing the, the UI enhancement, the sunset, 
replace it with a return to work return to work bonus, and then sometime closer to early autumn, like September or so, we get another fiscal package that's a little bit more well timed uh, into the election. Um, so we might be in for a bit of a choppy summer on that front. Um, but it, it, in terms of what you were saying, uh, in terms of you know pre present versus future thinking and, and the reserve currency stuff, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, UK have very, very small shares of, of global reserve currency, but they have the exact same capacity to set interest rates because their, debt, their debts are denominated in their own currencies. So you actually don't need to be the global reserve currency to have control over your own interest rate. In fact, Japan, which, which hasn't, you know, it hasn't been a global reserve currency, um, it, it has a good share in it, but like it's not huge. It was where the U.S. is right now. It was, it was there like, you know, a decade and a half ago. And all interest rates have done since then have gone down. And so the, the notion is that it's not the bond market. It's not interest rates that constrain deficits. It's inflation. If you have, because if you have, if you know, if you have too much fiscal stimulus going at one point, at, at any given point in time, and you don't have sufficient taxes and interest rates to mop up that excess spending, then you'll generate inflation. And if the central bank isn't hiking interest rates, it's going to lead to more and more inflation. We are so far from that threshold being met. And, and in fact, um, the best way to reduce the, the deficit of the GDP or debt to GDP would be growth itself. And there's a reason why growth has been so, uh, you know, so, so weak um, in, in, in the last 20 years. And it's predominantly been because, one, we had a globalization shock without redistributing the gains. So we had a huge globalization shock, but all, and there were huge gains for the economy, but they all went to very concentrated group of folks and companies, and they weren't redistributed. In fact, Bill Clinton balanced the budget into a global, globalization shock. Ironically enough, that, that helped lead to the mortgage bubble because there were so little U.S. so few U.S. treasuries in the system that Wall Street had to help meet the demand for them with mortgage-backed securities, uh, which is a very interesting dynamic of how fiscal, fiscal austerity can actually lead to the credit bubbles. But, but on top of that, too, we have demo the demographic impulse is not set to get that much better. It's nice that millennials are returning. But millennials are so big and they're starting to form families. This is why we were bullish home builders near the lows and, and we're not thinking that we would see too big of a housing crisis in response to the COVID unemployment. But at the same time, you know, unless we really see big immigration, big net in migration, it's going to be very difficult to generate enough of a demographic impulse to really be inflationary. And so, as you know, and, and these are very long cycles. The demographic cycles are very long cycles. So, so long as we have these disinflationary drivers and this much inequality, it's very difficult. It's very difficult for deficits to drive uh, inflation higher and constrain future fiscal spending. Um, and, and that's what. And, and I agree with you. There's there's optimal ways to use fiscal policy, and there are suboptimal ways to use fiscal policy. But in terms of the aggregates, you know, we're we're not going to run out of the money. Um, because all the money that, you know, the only, the only person, the only entity that is responsible for creating the money that these debts are paid off in is the U.S. government itself. And what we're starting to see, and it's very interesting, we're starting to see a nexus form, a bridge form between fiscal and monetary policy. We saw this during World War II. It was very effective. And, and, and we're seeing the beginnings of it forming in Europe, which is very interesting because now just, just the threat of a common budget, just the threat of Alexander Hamilton coming into Europe is making Portuguese, Spanish, Italian bond yields plunge. It has nothing to do, you know, it's not in response to deficits going up or down. It's just having a Confederate backstop and, and specifically a backstop from an entity that prints euros. And, and, and that's, back to the first question, I would say that's the thing that surprised me the most in a positive way is that Europe seems to be moving, inching toward a you know, common issuance and ultimately fiscal union. If this were to materialize, um, Europe is going to probably, um, its, its financial markets are likely to outperform the US's for, for the next 10 years or so, basically the complete opposite of the last 15 years. Well, we've brought it full circle and it looks like we're up against our 45 minute wall that we told everyone we'd keep it to. So I definitely appreciate all you guys joining us. Uh, Nafel, Ross, Charles and Andrew, thank you so much. Uh, to all the guests, thanks for taking the time out to listen to our banter back and forth here. And we look forward to having our conversation next week.
Uh, it's going to be on Monday evening. We're going to take a look at some of the civil unrest in the country, the protest, and what the proper response could be to them. So thank again, you to Stephen over at Young right. for connecting us with Russ. <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much, guys. Well, thank you for having me. Excellent panel discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank great, you so great, great to meet you, Ross. And, uh, thanks so much. Uh, with you, Ross. Likewise, a uh, great conversation. Um, I don't think I'll ever convince these guys about the evils <laughs> of government. Um, <laughs> hey, man. Hey, they, you're they, talking they, to they, hey, 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 Ross. You're talking to someone who used to work, spent two and a half years working on the hill. And uh, you know, if I would have if, <laughs> if I was still there, I probably would have been faced uh, face down and. On congressional ad because I just would have jumped out of one of the the House or Senate buildings because I just couldn't take it. So you know, it's, I, it's, it's always still a <laughs> right? It's always lesser. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know what that means, Ross? We just have to have a follow up discussion round two. <laughs> you know, next time no gloves. Always. I mean, as many follow ups as Rocky movies. <laughs> I mean, yeah, exactly. If that's what it's going to take, we're with it. Okay. Always, bye, bye. always I really enjoy it. Appreciate the conversation, guys. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thanks, right, guys. Take care, guys. Bye. Thanks for everyone for coming.